All right, uh, moving on then in Spangler, we're in the Destiny and Causality, page 129 in my unabridged edition, uh, subsection 4. Now Spangler is going to begin, this is one of my favorite parts of the entire book. Uh, now Spangler is going to be talking about the different destiny ideas that each culture has and how it's linked to their funerary cults. Uh, I love that shit. I wrote a whole unpublished manuscript on the, on the history of death and burial, which I turned into a YouTube series uh, on the history of death and burial, which I found very fascinating. Um, okay, so, subsection 4. He says, It follows from the meaning that we have attached to the culture as a prime phenomenon and to destiny as the organic logic of existence that each culture must necessarily possess its own destiny idea. Indeed, this conclusion is implicit from the first in the feeling that every great culture is nothing but the actualizing and form of a single, singularly constituted soul, and what cannot be felt by one sort of men exactly as it is felt by another, since the life of each is the expression of the idea proper to himself, and still less transcribe what is named by us conjuncture, accident, providence, or fate. By classical man, nemesis, ananki, taiki, or fatum, by the Arab kismet, uh, by everyone some way of his own, is just that of which each unique and unreproducible soul constitution, quite clear to those who share in it, is a rendering. The classical form of the destiny idea I shall venture to call Euclidean, naturally. Um, thus it is the sense-actual person of Oedipus, his empirical ego, nay, his... Uh, I think that says Soma. His Soma... Uh, the Greek word here, yeah, it's soma. Uh, nay, his soma that is hunted and thrown by destiny. Oedipus complains that Creon has mis misused his body, and that the oracle applied to his body, Aeschylus again speaks of Agamemnon as the royal body, leader of fleets. It is this same word soma that the mathematicians employ more than once for the bodies with which they deal. But the destiny of King Lear, of the analytical type, to use here also the term suggested by the corresponding number world, and consists in dark inner relationships. The idea of fatherhood emerges. Spiritual threads weave themselves into the action, incorporeal and transcendental, and are weirdly illuminated by the counterpoint of the secondary tragedy of Gloucester's house. Lear is, at the last, a mere name, the axis of something unbounded. This conception of destiny is the infinitesimal conception. It stretches out into infinite time and infinite space. It touches the bodily Euclidean existence, not at all, but affects only the soul. Consider the mad king between the fool and the outcast in the storm on the heath, and then look at the Laocoon group. The first is the Faustian, the other the Apollinean way of suffering. And if you don't know what the Laocoon group is, uh, look it up on Google. It's a statue. Then later in the Roman period, it's a copy of an earlier Hellenistic work uh, that dates from about the time of Pergamene art. It has the same theatricality about it, which shows uh, Lacoan in the center uh, with his two sons on either side of him, enwrapped by serpents that have been sent to punish them by an oracle. So the suffering is very bodily, in other words. Uh, the suffering in our epics and tragedies, especially in Shakespeare's tragedies, it's all mental, it's all psychological, it's all soul suffering, not bodily suffering. The body doesn't matter in uh, Faustian tragedy. Um, Sophocles, too, wrote a Lacoan drama, and we may be certain that there was nothing of pure soul agony in it. Antigone goes below ground in the body because she has buried her brother's body. Think of Ajax and Philoctetes and then of the Prince of Hamburg and Goethe's Tasso. Is not the difference between magnitude and relation traceable right into the depths of artistic creation? This is pretty amazing the way he's able to see this. He's got like this shamanistic x-ray vision where he can see into the insides of a culture and see the inward relationship shared by its mathematics, the infinitesimal calculus and differential equations uh, with the soul suffering of the heroes uh, in Shakespeare's plays or... Uh, Goethe's tragedies. Um, this brings us to another connection of high symbolic significance. The drama of the West is ordinarily designated character drama. 
That of the Greek, the Greeks, on the other hand, uh, is best described as situation drama. And in the antithesis, we can perceive what it is that Western and what it is that classical man, respectively, feel as the basic life form that is imperiled by the onsets of tragedy and fate. If in lieu of direction, we say irreversibility, if we let ourselves sink into the terrible meaning of those words, too late, wherewith we resign a fleeting bit of the present to the eternal past, we find the deep foundation of every tragic crisis. It is time that is the tragic, and it is by the meaning that it intuitively attaches to time that one culture is differentiated from another, and consequently tragedy of the grand order has only developed in the culture which has most passionately affirmed and in that which has most passionately denied time. Well, I had my own experience of what it means, what those words mean, too late. I know exactly what those words mean. The sentiment of the ahistoric soul gives us a uh, classical tragedy of the moment, and that of the ultra-historical soul puts before us Western tragedy that deals with the development of a whole life. Our tragedy arises from the feeling of an inexorable logic of becoming, while the Greek feels the illogical, blind, ca uh, casual of the moment. The life of Lear matures inwardly towards a catastrophe, and that of Oedipus stumbles without warning upon a situation. And now one may perceive how it is that, synchronously with Western drama, there rose and fell a mighty portrait art, culminating in Rembrandt, a kind of historical and biographical art which, because it was so, was sternly discountenanced in classical Greece at the apogee of Attic drama, considered the veto on likeness statuary and votive offerings, and note how, from Demetrius of Alapaki, about 400, a timid art of ideal portraiture began to venture forth when and only when grand tragedy had been thrown into the background by the light society pieces of the middle comedy. Fundamentally, all Greek statues were standard masks, like the actors in the theater of Dionysus, all bring to expression, in significantly strict form, somatic attitudes and positions. Physiognomically, they are dumb, corporeal and of necessity nude. Character heads of definite individuals came only with the Hellenistic age. Once more, we are reminded of the contrast between the Greek number world, with its computations of tangible results, and the other, our own, in which the relations between groups of functions or equations or generally formula elements of the same order are investigated morphologically, and the character of these relations fixed as such in express laws. In the so subsection 5 now, uh, I think in this section he moves on to a discussion of the funerary cults. Uh, so this is pretty cool. Um, in the capacity of experientially living history and the way in which history, particularly the history of personal becoming, is lived, one man differs very greatly from another. Every culture possesses a wholly individual way of looking at and comprehending the world as nature, or what comes to the same thing, it has its own peculiar nature, which no other sort of man can possess in exactly the same form. But in a far greater degree still, every culture including the individuals comprising it, who are separated only by minor distinctions, possesses a specific and peculiar sort of history, and it is in the picture of this and the style of this that the general and the personal, the inner and the outer, the world historical and the biographical becoming are immediately perceived, felt, and lived. Thus, the autobiographical tendency of Western man, revealed even in Gothic times in the symbol of auricular confession, is utterly alien to classical man, while his intense historical awareness is in complete contrast to the almost dreamy unconsciousness of the Indian. And when Magian man, primitive Christian or ripe scholar of Islam, uses the words world history, what is it that he sees before him? <clears throat> but it is difficult enough to form an exact idea even of the nature proper to another kind of man, although in this domain things specifically cognizable are causally ordered and unified in a communicable system, and it is quite impossible for us to penetrate completely a historical world aspect of becoming formed by a soul that is quite differently constituted from our own. Here there must always be an intractable residue, greater or smaller in proportion to our historical instinct, physiognomic tact, and knowledge of men, 
All the same, the solution of this very problem is the conditioned precedent of all really deep understanding of the world. The historical environment of another is a part of his essence, and no such other can be understood without the knowledge of his time sense, his destiny idea, and the style and degree of acuity of his inner life. Insofar, therefore, as these things are not directly confessed, we have to extract them from the symbolism of the alien culture. And as it is thus, and only thus, that we can approach the incomprehensible, the style of an alien culture and the great time symbols belonging thereto acquire an immeasurable importance. As an example of these hitherto almost uncomprehended signs, we may take the clock, a creation of highly developed cultures that becomes more and more mysterious as one examines it. Classical man managed to do without the clock, and his abstention was more or less deliberate. To the Augustan period, and far beyond it, the time of day was estimated by the length of one's shadow, although sundials and water clocks designed in conformity with a strict time reckoning and imposed by a deep sense of past and future had been in regular use in both the older cultures of Egypt and Babylonia. Classical man's existence, Euclidean, relationless, point-formed, was wholly contained in the instant. Nothing must remind him of past or future. For the true classical archaeology did not exist, nor did its spiritual inversion, astrology. The oracle and the sibyl, like the Etruscan Roman haruspices and augurs, did not foretell any distant future, but merely gave indications on particular questions of immediate bearing. No time reckoning entered intimately into everyday life, for the Olympiad sequence was a mere literary expedient, and what really matters is not the goodness or badness of a calendar, but the questions, who uses it, and does the life of the nation run by it? In classical cities, nothing suggested duration, or old times, or times to come. There was no pious preservation of ruins, no work conceived for the benefit of future generations. In them, we do not find that durable material was deliberately chosen. Uh, yeah, the concept of, a, of an amusement park like Disneyland, let's say, would have been totally, uh, would have never occurred to the classical imagination, simply because it a priori excludes it from its purview as an ahistorical culture, because Disneyland is a collection, a summation of various pasts, uh, with places like uh, the Fantasyland, you know, with the big castle, and uh, when you walk in Main Street, USA, and uh, the Western world, and then you have the future represented by Tomorrowland, um, this, this collection of his, historical chunks that have been ripped from their context in history and placed side by side so that we have the spatialization of time in a certain sense. Uh, these historical e epochs put right up next to each other to become an amusement park that we can walk through. And uh, Faustian Man immediately activates his time sense as he's walking through Disneyland. Disneyland's all about nostalgia. That's all it is. Uh, it's a whole celebration of nostalgia uh, turned into a festival. That would never in a million years have occurred to the Greeks to do anything of the kind. The Dorian Greek ignored the Mycenaean stone technique and built in wood or clay, though Mycenaean and Egyptian work was before him and the country produced first-class building stone. The Doric style is a timber style. Even in Pausanias' day, some wooden columns still lingered in the Heraeum of Olympia. The real organ of history is memory, in the sense which is always postulated in this book, viz. that which preserves as a constant present the image of one's personal past, and of a national and a world historical past as well, and is conscious of the course both of personal and of superpersonal becoming. That organ was not present in the makeup of a classical soul. There was no time in it. Immediately behind his proper present, the classical historian sees a background that is already destitute of temporal and therefore of inward order. For Thucydides, the Persian Moors, for Tacitus, the agitation of the Gracchi, were already in this vague background, and the great families of Rome had traditions that were pure romance. Witness Caesar's slayer Brutus, with his firm belief in his reputed tyrannicide ancestor. Caesar's reform of the calendar may almost be regarded as a deed of emancipation from the classical life feeling. But it must not be forgotten that Caesar also imagined a renunciation of Rome and a transformation of the city-state into an empire which was to be dynastic, marked with the badge of duration, and to have its center of gravity in Alexandria, which in fact is the birthplace of his calendar. Yes, that's why we have a solar calendar, because of Caesar's inhabitants at Alexandria. Uh, he was there with Cleopatra. Uh, also, before Mark Antony was, was there again with her, she got around, apparently, uh, and so 
the Egyptians had solar calendars. Most calendars in history have been <coughs> have been lunar calendars. Witness the, the Islamic and the Hebrew. <coughs> Those are lunar calendars. Most calendars in history were lunar, but not the Egyptians. They were solar. They went by uh, the 365-day uh, calendar, whereas the lunar calendar comes out to 350-something days and 13 months. Um, it's a very different calendar, and we owe to Caesar the transformation in our time reckoning to substitute the Egyptian calendar in our Western history uh, for the classical. Um, uh, and I believe that the classical had only 10 months, if I remember right from Robert Graves, um, which is why we've got displaced numbers. Uh, December is not the 10th month. November is not the, the 9th month. October is not the 8th month. September is not the 7th month. There's been a displacement there, uh, as both Caesar and Augustus were worshipped, uh, and their months, July and, and August, were inserted in there that displaced and bumped the 10-month calendar uh, by having those two months added in there, inter intercalated in there. Um, so the calendar has not been a stable thing. Everybody thinks it's, it's always been this way. It has not. Uh, the past is a construction of a culture. Spengler has a very good point here. Uh, every, con every culture constructs its own past. The image that we have right now with B.C. and A.D., uh, that's a convention. We made it up. It has nothing to do with actuality. It's just something we made up uh, to manage uh, time reckoning. His assassination, Caesar's, uh, seems to us a last outburst of the anti-duration feeling that was incarnate in the polis and the herbs Rom Roma. Even then, classical mankind was still living every hour and every day for itself, and this is equally true whether we take the individual Greek or Roman, or the city, or the nation, or the whole culture, the hot-blooded pageantry, palace orgies, circus battles of Nero or Caligula. Tacitus is a true Roman in describing only these and ignoring the smooth progress of life in the distant provinces. Our final and flamboyant expressions of the Euclidean world feeling that deified the body in the present. The Indians also have no sort of time reckoning, the absence of it, in their case expressing their nirvana, and no clocks, and therefore no history, no life memories, no care. What the conspicuously historical West calls Indian history achieved itself without the smallest consciousness of what it was doing. The millennium of the Indian culture between the Vedas and Buddha seems like the stirrings of a sleeper. Here life was actually a dream. From all this, our Western culture is unimaginably remote, which is why when you look at the history of Indian sculpture, uh, which was copied from Greek, Greek sculpture, the Hindus had no conception of sculpture until the Greek dynasties in Bactria, which is in the west, I, I think it's above the Indus Valley, uh, these Greek dynasties in Bactria, uh, and I've forgotten the other one, brought the idea of sculpture in stone to the Hindus, and they picked it up from the Greeks, oh, about 300 B.C., about the time. This is all a remnant of Alexander's conquests, uh, shortly after Alexander, 200 B.C. There are, sculpture is, begins and is up and running by that point. They didn't have much uh, before that. Uh, the millennium, uh, let's see, it's actually from all... From all this, our Western culture is unimaginably remote, and indeed man has never, not even in the contemporary China of the Joe, of the Zhou period, with its highly developed sense of eras and epochs, been so awake and aware, so deeply sensible of time, and conscious of direction and fate and movement as he has been in the West. Western history was willed, and Indian history happened. In classical existence years, in Indian centuries scarcely counted, but here the hour, the minute, yea, the second is of importance, of the tragic tension of a historical crisis like that of August 1914, when even moments seem overpowering, neither a Greek nor an Indian could have, uh, could have had any idea. Think of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where every second counted, uh, also for the Faustian imagination. Such crises, too, a deep-feeling man of the West can experience within himself as a true Greek could never do. Over our countryside, day and night, from thousands of belfries, ring the bells that join future to past and fuse the point moments of the classical present into a grand relation. The epoch which marks the birth of our culture, the time of the Saxon emperors, marks also the discovery of the wheel clock. Without exact time measurement, without a chronology of becoming, to correspond with his imperative need of archaeology, the preservation, excavation, and collection of things become, 
Western man is unthinkable. The Baroque age intensified the Gothic symbol of the belfry to the point of grotesqueness and produced a pocket watch that constantly accompanies the individual. Another symbol, as deeply significant and as little understood as the symbol of the clock, is that of the funeral customs, which all great cultures have consecrated by ritual and by art. The grand style in India begins with tomb temples, in the classical world with funerary urns, in Egypt with pyramids, in early Christianity with catacombs and sarcophagi. In the dawn, innumerable, equally possible forms still cross one another chaotically and obscurely, dependent on clan custom and external necessities and conveniences, but every culture promptly elevates one or another of them to the highest degree of symbolism. Classical man, obedient to his deep, unconscious life feeling, picked upon burning, an act of annihilation in which the Euclidean, the here and now type of existence, was powerfully expressed. He willed to have no history, no duration, neither past nor future, neither preservation nor dissolution, and therefore he destroyed that which no longer possessed the present, the body of a Pericles, a Caesar, a Sophocles, a Phidias. And the soul passed to join the vague crowd to which the living members of the clan paid, but soon ceased to pay the homage of ancestor worship and soul feast, and which in its formlessness presents an utter contrast to the ancestor series, the genealogical tree that is eternalized with all the marks of historical order in the family vault of the West. In this, with one striking exception, the Vedic dawn in India, no other culture parallels the classical, and be it noted that the Doric Homeric spring, and above all the Iliad, invested this act of burning with all the vivid feeling of a newborn symbol. For those very warriors whose deeds probably formed the nucleus of the epic were in fact buried almost in the Egyptian manner in the graves of Mycenae, Tyrans, or Cominus and other places. And when in imperial times the sarcophagus, or flesh consumer, began to supersede the base of ashes, it was again, as in the time when the Homeric urn superseded the shaft grave of Mycenae, a changed sense of time that underlay the change of rite. The Egyptians, who preserved their past in memorials of stone and hieroglyph, so purposefully that we, 4,000 years after them, can determine the order of their king's reigns, so thoroughly eternalized their bodies that today the great pharaohs lie in our museums, recognizable in every lineament, a symbol of grim triumph. While Dorian kings, not even the names, have survived, for our own part we know the exact birthdays and death days of almost every great man since Dante, and moreover, we see nothing strange in the fact. Yet, in the time of Aristotle, the very zenith of classical education, it was no longer known with certainty if Lucipus, the founder of atomism and a contemporary of Pericles, i.e. hardly a century before, had ever existed at all, much as though, for us, the existence of Giordano Bruno was a matter of doubt, and the Renaissance had become pure saga. And these museums themselves, in which we assemble everything that is left of the corporeally sensible past, are not they a symbol of the highest rank? Are they not intended to conserve in mummy the entire body of cultural development? As we collect countless data in milliards of printed books, do we not also collect all the works of all the dead cultures in these myriad halls of West European cities, in the mass of the collection depriving each individual piece of that instant of actualized purpose that is its own? The one property that the classical soul would have respected in ipso facto dissolving it into our unending and unresting time. Consider what it was that the Hellenes uh, and the Mycenaeans, how deep a significance lies in the change of sense. This book itself is a museum. I mean, this, this, this book itself is the literary equivalent of one of our museums, uh, our natural history museums, where you walk through, like the one in New York, where you walk through the history of civilization, looking at Hindu sculpture over here, Native American art over there, classical sculpture over here, uh, this book is, is very much a museum that is itself a production of Faustian time consciousness. Uh, let's see, uh, that might be a good stopping point for this video right there.